Welcome back. If you're just joining us, we're reading chapter 11, The Last Wish, part two. And where we left off, Mother had returned to the home and was interrogating Martha about all the jewellery that had just turned up in her room without any explanation. So we'll see what happens next. Here we go. Martha burst into heavy sobs. Oh, I was going to give you warning this very day, Mum, to leave at the end of my month, so I was, on account of me going to make a respectable young man happy. The gamekeeper he is by trade, Mum, and I, I wouldn't deceive you of the name of Beale. Uh, and it's as true as I stand here, it was your coming home in such a hurry, and no warning given, out of the kindness of his heart it was, as he says, Martha, my beauty, he says, which I ain't and never was, but, but you, you know how them men will go on. Uh, I can't see you a-toiling and a-moiling and not lend a helping hand, and which mine is a strong arm, and, and, and it's yours, Martha, my dear, says he. And, and so he helped me a-cleaning of the windows. But, but outside, Mum, the whole time, and me in, if I never say another breathing word, it's the gospel truth. Were you with him the whole time? asked her mistress. Him outside and me in I was, said Martha, except for fetching up a fresh pail and the leather that, 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 that Eliza hidden away behind the mangle. That will do, said the children's mother. I'm not pleased with you, Martha, but you have spoken the truth, and that counts for something. When Martha had gone, the children clung round their mother. Oh, mummy darling, cried Anthea, it isn't Beale's fault, it isn't really, he's a great dear he is, truly and honourably, and as honest as the day. Don't let the police take him, mummy, oh don't, don't, don't. It was truly awful. Here was an innocent man accused of robbery through that silly wish of Jane's, and it was absolutely useless to tell the truth. All longed to, and they thought of the straws in the hair and the shrieks of the other frantic maniacs, and they could not do it. Is there a cart hereabouts? asked the mother feverishly. A, a, a trap of any sort? I, I must drive into Rochester and tell the police at once. All the children sobbed. There's a cart at the farm, but oh, don't go! Don't go! Oh, don't go! Wait till Daddy comes home! Mother took not the faintest notice. When she'd set her mind on a thing, she always went straight through with it. She was rather like Anthea in this respect. Look here, Cyril, she said, sticking on her hat with long, sharp, violet-headed pins. I leave you in charge. Stay in the dressing room. You can pretend to be swimming boats in the bath or something. Say I gave you leave, but stay there with the door on the landing open. I've locked the other. And don't let anyone go into my room. Remember, no one knows the jewels are there except me and all of you and the wicked thieves who put them there. Robert, you stay in the garden and watch the windows. If anyone tries to get in, you must run and tell the two farmmen that I'll send up to wait in the kitchen. I'll tell them there are dangerous characters about. That's true enough. Now, remember, I trust you both. But I don't think they'll try it till after dark, so you're quite safe. Well, goodbye, darlings. And she locked her bedroom door and went off with the key in her pocket. The children could not help admiring the dashing and decided way in which she'd acted. They thought how useful she would have come in organising escape from some of the tight places in which they'd found themselves of late, in consequence of their ill-timed wishes. She's a born general, said Cyril, but I don't know what's going to happen to us. Even if the girls were to hunt for that old Sammy Ab and find it and get it to take the jewels away again, Mother would only think we, we hadn't looked out properly and let the burglars sneak in and take them. Or else the police will think we've got them. Or, or else that she's been fooling them. Oh, it's a pretty decent average ghastly mess this time, and no mistake. He savagely made a paper boat and began to float it in the bath, as he'd been told to do. Robert went into the garden and sat down on the worn yellow grass with his miserable head between his helpless hands. Anthea and Jane whispered together in the passage downstairs, where the coconut matting was, with the hole in it that you always caught your foot in if you were not careful. Martha's voice could be heard in the kitchen, grumbling loud and long. Oh, it's simply quite too dreadfully awful, said Anthea. How do you know all the diamonds are there too, if they aren't? The police will think mother and father have got them, and that they've only given up some of them for a kind of desperate blind. And they'll be put in prison, and we shall be branded outcasts, the children of felons. And it won't be at all nice for father and mother either, she added, by a candid afterthought. But what can we do? asked Jane. Nothing. At least, 
We might look for the Samiad again. It, it's a very, very hot day. He might have come out to warm that whisker of his. Hmm. He won't give us any more beastly wishes today, said Jane flatly. He gets crosser and crosser every time we see him. I believe he hates having to give wishes. Anthea had been shaking her head gloomily. Now she stopped shaking it so suddenly that it really looked as though she were pricking up her ears. What is it? asked Jane. Oh, have you, have you thought of something? Ah, one chance, cried Anthea dramatically. The last lone, lorn, forlorn hope. Come on! At a brisk trot, she led the way to the sand pit. Oh, joy! There was the Samiad, basking in a golden sandy hollow and preening its whiskers happily in the glowing afternoon sun. The moment it saw them, it whisked round and began to burrow. It evidently preferred its own company to theirs, but Anthea was too quick for it. She caught it by its furry shoulders, gently but firmly, and held it. Here! None of that! said the Samiad. Leave go of me, will you? But Anthea held him fast. Dear, kind, darling Samiad, she said breathlessly. Oh, yes, it's all very well, it said. You want another wish, I expect, but I can't keep on slaving from morning till night, giving people their wishes. I, I must have some time to myself. Do you hate giving wishes? asked Anthea gently, and her voice trembled with excitement. Of course I do, it said. Leave go of me or I'll bite. I really will. I mean it. Oh, well, if you choose to risk it. Anthea risked it and held on. Look here, she said. Don't bite me. Listen to reason. If you'll only do what we want today, we'll never ask you for another wish as long as we live. The Samiad was much moved. Well, I'd do anything, it said in a tearful voice. I'd almost burst myself to give you one wish after another as long as I held out if you'd only never, never ask me to do it after today. Oh, if you knew how I hate to blow myself out with other people's wishes and how frightened I am always that I shall strain a muscle or something and, and then to wake up every morning and know you've got to do it. You don't know what it is. You don't know what it is. You don't. Its voice cracked with emotion and that last don't was a squeak. Anthea set it down gently on the sand. It's all over now, she said soothingly. We promise faithfully never to ask for another wish after today. Well, go ahead, said the Samiad. Let's get it over. How many can you do? I don't know. As long as I can hold out. Well, first I wish Lady Chittenden may find she's never lost her jewels. The Samiad blew itself out, collapsed and said, Done. I wish, said Anthea more slowly, Mother may get to the police. Done, said the creature, after the proper interval. I wish, said Jane suddenly, Mother could forget all about the diamonds. Done, said the Samiad, but its voice was weaker. Would you like to rest a little? asked Anthea considerately. Yes, please, said the Samiad. And before we go any further, will you wish something for me? Can't you do wishes for yourself? Of course not, it said. We were always expected to give each other our wishes, not that we had any to speak of in the good old Megatherium days. Just wish, will you, that you may never be able, any of you, to tell anyone a word about me. Why? asked Jane. Why? Don't you, don't you see? If you told grown-ups, I should have no peace of my life. They'd get hold of me. And they wouldn't wish silly things like you do, but real earnest things. And the scientific people would hit on some way of making things last after sunset, as likely as not. And they'd ask for a graduated income tax and old age pensions and manhood suffrage and the free secondary education and dull things like that. And, and get them and keep them and the whole world would be turned topsy-turvy. Do wish it, quick! Anthea repeated the Samiad's wish and it blew itself out to a larger size than they had yet seen it attain. And now, it said as it collapsed, can I do anything more for you? Just one thing, and I think that clears everything up, doesn't it, Jane? I wish Martha to forget about the diamond ring, and Mother to forget about the keeper cleaning the windows. It's like the brass bottle, said Jane. Yes, I'm glad we read that, or I should never have thought of it. Now said the Samiad faintly. I'm almost worn out. 
Is there anything else? No. Only thank you kindly for all you've done for us, and I hope you'll have a good long sleep, and I hope we shall see you again someday. Is that a wish? It said in a weak voice. Yes, please, said the two girls together. Then, for the last time in this story, they saw the Samoyad blow itself out and collapse suddenly. It nodded to them, blinked its long snail's eyes, burrowed and disappeared, scratching fiercely to the last, and the sand closed over it. I hope we've done right, said Jane. I'm sure we have, said Anthea. Come on, let's go home and tell the boys. Anthea found Cyril glooming over his paper boats and told him. Jane told Robert. The two tales were only just ended when Mother walked in, hot and dusty. She explained that as she was being driven into Rochester to buy the girls' autumn school dresses, the axle had broken, and but for the narrowness of the lane and the high soft hedges, she would have been thrown out. As it was, she was not hurt, but she had to walk home. And, oh, my dearest chicks, she said, I am simply dying for a cup of tea. Do run and see if the water boils. So you see, it's all right, Jane whispered. She doesn't remember. No more does Martha, said Anthea, who'd been to ask after the state of the kettle. As the servants sat at their tea, Beale the gamekeeper dropped in. He brought the welcome news that Lady Chittenden's diamonds had not been lost at all. Lord Chittenden had taken them to be reset and cleaned and the maid who knew about it had gone for a holiday, so that was all right. I wonder if we shall ever see the Samoyad again, said Jane wistfully as they walked in the garden, while Mother was putting the lamb to bed. I'm sure we shall, said Cyril, if you really wished it. We promised never to ask it for another wish, said Anthea. <laughs> I never want to, said Robert earnestly. They did see it again, of course, but not in this story. And it was not in the sandpit either, but in a very, very, very different place. It was in a... But I must say no more. The end. Thank you very much for joining me while we've read Five Children and It. I hope you've enjoyed yourselves. I know I've enjoyed myself. And perhaps I'll see you again for another story sometime. See you around. <laughs>